and F4 Podcast. Welcome back, guys, to another top 10 list. So this is going to be our last top 10 list of the year, and it's going to be top 10 rap songs of 2020. We did one on albums. We did one on breakthrough artists. And listen, it's only fitting that we end off with the songs, man. It's been an exciting year as far as singles go, but we didn't really hear from anyone that big. But before we actually jump into this episode, guys, please hit that subscribe button, hit the notification tab. We're connecting the world to hip hop. Lou, welcome us into the episode and explain, you know, we, who we have on because he's a pretty special guest today. Yeah, so it's the top 10 rap songs of the year. I mean, we, we could have kind of made it more broad and focused on all music, but we decided to really hone in on the best rap songs of the year specifically. And we're welcomed by Joey, um, that you guys might know from Twitter. So Joey, welcome to the episode. And uh, yeah, man. Hey, happy to be here. All right, man. So listen, explain a bit more about your page and, you know, explain what type of content you do. So if anyone wants to reach you after this, they could go see your page and get your awesome content. Yeah, definitely. So I run a hip hop page on Twitter. Um, I'm up to 14,000 followers now and change. Um, I post daily content. So sometimes that's memes. Sometimes it's top 10 lists. Sometimes it's threads, breaking down albums. It's it's all sorts of stuff. So yeah, give me a give me a follow at um, at Joey underscore hip hop and yeah. Yeah, he has a crazy page, and you know Joey has been supporting us since the jump, and uh, you know you, that's pretty much all the guests that we have on the show. You know, everyone um, who has been on so far has fucked with us, and it's been awesome because it's been a great year for NFR. You know, the Twitter's been bumping; we've been able to get a lot more fans from there, and you know you guys are liking the content, so it's only fitting to come in with these songs now. And Lou, I think we just have to tell people that you know if they're if they're expecting like something from Circles or After Hours from the weekend, you know we didn't include it. You know, we said that this was strictly going to be hip hop. We included some of that in our top 10 albums. You guys could go check that mm -hmm. out. But what makes um, 2020 so strong in hip hop, let's say? Because there are some strengths. It's not the strongest year because of coronavirus. But, you know, what do you think were the strong points? With I this think year? that a lot of the mainstream audience kind of got a taste for the underground because a lot of underground releases, you know, stroke, stroke upon us this year and in a big way just because they got their audience expanded to a whole nother level. Um, but to start off this list, I want to start with someone who had a huge comeback this year and who shocked the whole industry, and that's Logic. And at number 10, we have GP4. Yeah, this is a crazy song, and it has that, you know, it's just, it's probably the best song on No Pressure, in my opinion, you know, and you guys could go through the whole album and kind of sort of see, like, okay, like, you know, there's so many strong tracks on this. There's but Open Mic slash Aquarius 3, there's Soul Food 2. It's just, it's banger after banger. It is, and it's such a strong project. So, Joey, um, what do you think about Logic's whole comeback in 2020? And, you know, were you a big fan of No Pressure as a whole, let alone JP4? So, I was super excited about this album. Um, I wasn't the biggest Logic fan before this, but I was always rooting for him because he seems like a pretty good guy. Um, and unfortunately, like, his, there was like a, what, four or five year stretch where his his output was not amazing in my opinion. I, I think that he was struggling to find his voice. He wanted like the mainstream hit, but at the same time, like he couldn't find that authenticity. So I, and I'm a, I'm a fan of um, under pressure. I'm a fan of the incredible true story and his mixtapes. So uh, to see him get back on track here with no pressure was amazing. Um, it's, it's a little, it's a little sad that he's retiring now, but it was, it's great that he like, came from this this place that was really low and got back to the quality that he started with so i'm i'm super happy to have you know seen logic do that and i really enjoy the album i think it's great so i'm 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 happy with how logic went out yeah and i just i love his use of samples on gp4 just because he samples outcast um elevators from at aliens and he also samples public enemy so those two samples were perfectly chopped up by no id and by six and I just love the whole vibe of the song, the energy, um, and also, um, you know, the content. Because Logic raps about, you know, coming a long way since the HOC, which is housing projects. And it's kind of that under pressure type content where he takes us through his struggles growing up. And I, I loved every second of it. Yeah, and it gave me a big, you know, a big vintage no pressure vibe because he was actually able to fit in five different flow switches on this song alone and you know when you're going through the track it starts off sort of like you hear that class or, uh, that classic elevator sample and you're like holy shit he's actually trying to target this now and then you see him go through the track and you know you think he's gonna stop after the third flow but he just keeps on going and keeps on going
going. So that's what I like about it. It gave me super big under pressure vibes. And, you know, it was crazy to see the, the, the sort of mentality he was in when he was creating, you know, uh, under pressure. And then, you know, how he sort of grew as an artist and as a person and was able to deliver on no pressure. Um, do you guys think that this is a, a top five album of the year? You know, like now that we're sort of going into it? I think it's definitely top 10 albums of the year. I don't know if it would, would crack my personal top five, but um, it's definitely one of my most played albums of the year. How about you, Joey? It's probably top 20 for me. Um, I I think the best way to describe it is like Logic sounds comfortable in this album. And it's definitely when Logic is at his best is when he's like on a track where he's spitting a lot, a lot of times like about his past. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of my favorites. I don't know if it's quite top five, um, but it, it's still good for sure. Yeah, you can make the argument for any sort of list that you want to put it into. It's a great project. It has a lot of quality. But let's go on to number nine, ladies and gentlemen. We got BQE by a personal favorite of Joey's. I know Coda the Friend featuring Joey Badass and Boz. This is a fantastic track. And I was super excited when this dropped just because I saw what was going on with the features. Then I realized Coda was actually the one that probably had the biggest performance on and, this. And, and I didn't even know who Coda the Friend was, to be honest, before I saw the announcement that he'd be dropping a song with Baz and Joey Badass and you know after I heard the song of course I loved it and then I kind of got into Code of the Friends music and then of course he dropped everything this year and I was blown away by his unique aesthetic to be honest yeah and the BQE name stands for the Brooklyn Queens Expressway I'm not sure if I yeah, butchered it's that. a highway in New York it's a it's a highway in New York so Joey you know what do you like about Coda and you know what did you like about you know this drop in particular rather than you know everything that he released in the past yeah, so I just want to start by saying I was super hyped when this track came out because I saw the Joey Bass and uh, Boss features, and I was just, like, super hyped that there are some, like, big names that, like, we're finally starting to recognize Coda's ability. Um, so, so, yeah, I think the track is great. Coda, so what makes Coda stand out from other rappers? Um, he's just, he got this vibe that's just totally unique. It's, like, it's like a little bit of old chants in there. You got some, like, lo-fi, like, hip-hop beats. It's just this really unique vibe that like takes me to a to a deserted island that like just puts me in a different mindset than like any other rapper can do. Um, and this this track itself I think is unique for Coda because he's like flexing his lyrical ability more so than he usually does. Um, so that was cool to see. And he definitely holds his own against these uh, these two legends. Yeah, and I feel like it's a perfect proof that there's hope for New York hip hop just because these are, you know, three of the strongest MCs that we have right now in terms of New York um, artists. And I also love Coda's content once again in this song just because, you know, he raps about staying independent, not wanting to get into any, th any 360 deals. And he has a bar that says, y'all playing easy to get, I'm playing a Russian roulette where, you know, he's kind of taking the chances on himself and he believes in himself and he knows that his music you know, is strong enough to the point where he doesn't need the backing of a label. Yeah, not only that, but it's a, it allows you to enter sort of a um, a different sort of breezy state. You know, sort of a summer sort of vibe too. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, I'm breezing. I'm I'm ninety on the on the I'm ninety on the BQE. You know, like it was just it feels good bumping this in your car. And this I, this was a I believe this dropped in May May first yeah. of 2020. So it was fitting. It was perfect. It was like okay, we're getting into that season. And what I liked about Coda's drop is that he was not scared of a coronavirus. And um, a lot of people did fuck up their rollouts because of Corona. You know, that's obviously expected. And we've mentioned that so many times on the podcast it's such an ongoing theme but as of uh, as of coda you know it was a completely different vibe he wasn't scared to do it and that's why he gave the fans the music and it was you know it was rightfully so delivered and you know this song is perfect it's you know it's something it's definitely a top 10 song of the year bro i remember when this came out and i had this on repeat you know for the next three weeks it was definitely heavy in my playlist but let's go on to number eight you know we have an album that i'm a big fan of and has a very deep personal connection to me it is treated all by benny the butcher off of burden of proof joey i'm gonna start with you man are you a fan of this album and you know how heavy is uh, benny the butcher's burden of proof in your rotation all right so this album was big because to me ben is the best um rapper in griselda arguably the best he's i feel like most people probably got him top two at least um and this was griselda's year right like they were they were dropping like crazy and they got this model that's it's not quality over quantity, it's quality and quantity, which is pretty insane. Um, and so I thought this this album just like 
was a perfect encapsulation of Griselda's year. Um, they've just been killing it, and here's Benny, who's arguably the best member, just absolutely smashing it on this album, too. So yeah. I, I, I'm definitely one of my faves of the year. Yeah, and I just love um, how much important you know thematic elements benny you know put in into only two minutes and a half where he raps about you know kind of being overlooked by um labels like specifically shady records who eminem signed west side gun and conway the machine in 2017 but didn't sign benny the butcher overlooked him so he talks about being overlooked but more importantly he talks about how he would trade all of his fame all of his money to get back his loved ones that he's lost, including his brother. And um, it's really emotional to me. And it really, it shook me to, to my core, just like a lot of the songs on Burden of Proof do, just because um, we saw a side to Benny the Butcher that we've never seen before. Yeah, we're so used to that 97 Hove type of uh, type of Benny where he's going off and he's talking about the street life. And, you know, he does this in this album, but in a different approach. And it's sort of like, a, it gives me a big Jay-Z vibe where it was kind of like giving you the street knowledge, but the other side of the street knowledge where it's kind of like, you know, telling you what the real consequences of it are. And another great thing about this song is that he's also talking about, you know, the importance of family, giving back to your kids, you know, making sure that everyone in your circle is safe and everyone is being fed and at the end of the day no fame nor money is able to replace that and that's extremely powerful coming from a guy like that because if you compare the last two projects we got from him that's not the type of content matter that we got you know so it was a big risk on his part everyone was sort of wanting that you know um that tana talk three sort of vibe or the plugs i met sort and of he vibe. gave us some of that but yeah. it wasn't the full focus in, in a completely different way you know and then he gives these personal anecdotes that are extremely you know sentiment there's a lot of sentiment mental value to it and then you could you're allowed to apply that to yourself and then you could see like you know the parallels in your life to benny's life and to, yeah. to me trade it all is kind of benny the yeah. butchers never change and i like to compare it to that hove song just because they're both talking about the importance of staying close to their roots and of course they're just they're, they both show off their authenticity and the soul productions of course are phenomenal on both songs so i thought it was a cool comparison it was definitely a cool comparison so let's move on to number seven and this is a song that i feel as if it wasn't talked a lot about it wasn't talked a lot about on on hip-hop twitter like when it dropped obviously people were talking about it but you know that whole detroit 2 rollout was sort of there for two weeks and then after that people sort of you know steered away from it and you know the num the number seven um, place on our list is actually Deep Reverence. It's by Big Sean featuring Nipsey Hussle. Um, so Joey, I'm going to ask you something. How do you feel about Detroit 2 and why do you like Deep Reverence so much? I'm a huge fan of Detroit 2. Um, it was my favorite album of the year for a good amount of time. I think recently I kind of changed my opinion, but it's still like definitely top five for me. Um, and this this song is a good summary of like why i like this album and sean's mindset coming into this album um so for those that don't know he struggled with depression for the past few years and he was all over the place mentally like could not figure out what type of rapper he wanted to be could not like find the right mind space for writing an album so and i think that's most clear on his uh um on that collab mixtape with uh, Metro Boomin, Double or Nothing. It's like, it's it's pretty clearly his worst project yet. And you can tell he's just in a low place, like has no artistic direction. So anyways, Detroit 2 is just a great return to form for him. And he just has found his place again. He's happy. Um, he's with Janae Aiko. Um, so Deep Reverence, they're just, there's so much good um, nutrients here from Big Sean and his mindset. Um, he gets really personal. He talks about the beef with Kendrick, which was kind of like a uh, off and on thing. Like, is it happening? Is it not? Do they hate each other? Whatever. Um, but he, he just said that like he reached out to Kendrick, like realized it was just a, um, a miscommunication. And of course, all of this is in the shadow of Nipsey Hussle's passing. So it's great to hear Nipsey on the track, but it just is also like really sad to just remind us that he's he's no longer here. So it's a it's a great track. Sean's really personal on it. I think the lyrics are great. Production is great by Hit Boy. Um, big fan of the track. Big fan of the album. Yeah, I think the Grammys actually got something right this year in the sense that they nominated Deep Reverence for Best Rap Performance of the Year. And to me, Nipsey Hussle absolutely stole the show. 
Um, I think it's one of his best hooks ever. And every single verse that he's been on, you know, after he's passed away has just been flawless. And it just, this beat too sounds like a beat that could have been off of Victory Lap. And mm-hmm. um, there, there's there's so many bars in this that are memorable from Nipsey. He has one that says, I was I was birthed in, this, in, the, in the C-section, which is kind of a double entendre because, you know, of course, there's a literal sense of a C-section where you're, the, the stomach's cut open and that's how the baby's delivered. But it's also because of his association with the Crips earlier on in his life. And I just think that Nippy, Nipsey not knocked it out of the park with this one. Yeah, and th- not only that, but the line, uh, fuck rap, I'm a street legend. That just, iconic. I- iconic. That just shows you the type of, you know, the type of energy that Nipsey comes with on a track. And it almost felt as if, um, you know, I- I'm not sure how the how the verse was placed. I'm not sure, you know, if posthumously they, they had that verse stored and then they just put it over an instrumental. But the song sounded so complete. Like, it didn't sound posthumous at all. And I actually do think that Nipsey recorded that with Big Sean in the studio before he sadly passed away and um the craziest part about the whole song is like that whole interview that he's doing at the end of the at the end of the song where big sean kind of just plugs it in there and he's like you know so you're trying to link up with in, in detroit and he talks about t grizzly and then often obviously he says well you know me and big sean got something coming on the way and for those who do not know nipsey hustle um the most of his knowledge and most of his value comes in his interviews Uh, a lot of people listen to his music for motivation and a lot of people listen to his music um you know to gain that sort of power and you know that sort of enlightenment within yourself but a big part of his knowledge is actually given through these interviews because he's always talking about you know pushing the limits being independent you know trying to make your own dough doing your own marketing and becoming your own boss and that's what i love about nipsey here is that he's sort of giving you that but like he's talking from the guy because you obviously he's obviously not here to deliver it so it's a beautiful track it's definitely you know this could be a top five track for me you know it's it was in my rotation so heavy when detroit 2 dropped and i'm just i'm a huge fan for it but lou i want you to introduce us to number six on this yeah so number six is one of the biggest songs of the year it's little baby's highest charting song on the billboard hall 100 it peaked at number three and the bigger picture was nominated for two grammys this year that was best rap song as well as best rap performance and I just love the whole concept that he went on with this song where, you know, he took inspiration by being in the streets of Atlanta protesting and leading a group of people while riding a bicycle. Yeah. With very unconventional stuff, but it was really cool. And I think that the fact that he was inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement really shines through the song and all of his lyrics are really genuine. So I want to ask you, Joey, what was your first impressions when you first heard The Bigger Picture? I was pretty surprised by the subject matter because Lil Baby is pretty infamous for not really diving deep into social issues or um, anything too profound, but he does a pretty good job here um, just describing the situation we're in, not only with COVID, but also with all the um, Black Lives Matter protests and the police brutality acts over the summer. So it's a... it's a pretty mature statement from little baby, um, you know, who's not, this, this is not his lane at all, but he feels so strongly about these issues that he's willing to shift his subject matter for the time being to, you know, give, give us something about, you know, something, something more emotional, something more serious, something more important than what he usually puts out. So I'm, you know, I love his, I love his party tracks, but I really appreciated the fact that he like dove deeper here. He did dive deep and I was super surprised as well because I was listening to the track and, you know, I was kind of taken away by it because I didn't expect Lil Baby to dive into that bag. And if you want to talk about, you know, Lil Baby only, you know, only being able to cash in on commercial success by doing a certain type of music, then you're completely wrong here. Because as you said before, he was able to debut at number three on the charts with a song that was super politically conscious. And even at that, it was just the perfect time to put it out, right? Because he was, uh, you know, especially around that time like right after he dropped my turn everyone was willing to listen to Lil Baby like I don't think there was anyone that was you know that was not fucking with Lil Baby and he comes out and he releases a song that speaks to everyone and that was resonating with everyone at the time and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him for doing that because he could have released let's say you know a three song EP with you know that had nothing to do with it or he could have released another single with another feature you know that he has stored in his vault and probably made the same bag over it because he had the hype but he chose to take his hype and to speak about something that was actually coherent like I was listening 
listening to this baby track and there was some seriously good uh, material in here like it was nothing that you would you know you would expect little babies um, emotional stuff to be a bit more um on the lower end vibe like you're not getting any j cole here but this was some really powerful stuff so you know do you think this was maybe just a product of you know him trying to really extend his lane and really try to you know go for a different type of sound here or do you think this was just him being really emotional about it and really tapping in yeah i think he just tried to show people that he can do more than just you know rap about drugs or whatever the case may be and he's he actually mentions that in the song where he's very self-aware and he tells his fans like yeah i do rap about drugs and murder and all this type of stuff but you know at the end of the day I'm still a genuine person and I still want you guys to go out and vote. I want you guys to be socially conscious in your communities. And what I think is really um, admirable by Lil Baby is that all of the proceeds for this song went to the Black Lives Matter movement. It went to Breonna Taylor's uh, lawyer and other organizations. So it was really honorable for Lil Baby to do that. Yeah, he had a great he had a great run on this, and it was just it was beautiful to see what he was able to do with a track. Um, number five. So now we're halfway through the list. You know, shit, we're already running this. Uh, we're running through this pretty quick here. Um, we got we, we got we got Freddie Gibbs is something to rap about, but we really want to concentrate on Tyre the Creator's amazing feature run in 2020. So Lou, introduce us with some facts and tell us what he did. Yeah, what's crazy is that something to rap about is actually the first ever collaboration between Freddie Gibbs and Tyler the Creator. And it just, when I first saw Tyler on that track list, I was blown away just because it's a very unusual pairing. Like if you told me that Tyler and Freddie Gibbs were making a track together, I wouldn't believe it. And um, it's such a relaxed beat. Alchemist killed it. And, you know, their chemistry actually really worked well. And I was surprised and it ended up being one of the best songs off of Alfredo. So Joey, tell me, what were your thoughts on something to rap about? I, I loved it. I was super happy to hear Tyler on this sort of production. I think it's a big, um, it's very different than what Tyler has been doing recently. Um, and he's, he hasn't really, so like aside from this year, he hadn't been giving us many tracks where he was just spitting bars, right? He's been, he's been in his producing mode. He's been like singing and I love that stuff. I love Igor, but I, dude, I really fuck with him when he's just like on a hard ass soul beat. And I just, Dude, this, this track is great. Um, he's definitely the highlight, and it's definitely the highlight of Tyler's feature run in this year. Yeah, Tyler's feature run is impressive because um, you could almost stack it up against Cole's 2018 run. I'm just joking. Obviously not, but it's definitely impressive. And it's so diverse in it with anything Tyler's doing because, as Joey mentioned before, he was more in his singing lane. You know, it was more popish. It was more of, you know, something where he wanted to really showcase his artistry, and that's what Igor was meant for. It was completely, it was something completely different than, let's say, Cherry Bomb or, or Flower Boy. And that's what's crazy about Tyler, the creator, is that with every project or every song, that he releases he's able to reinvent himself and when he was doing these features i was listening you know yeah I, I think it was on 327 i was sort of expecting that you know hook tyler the creator or some you know that light singing you know him on his harmonies type stuff i wasn't expecting him to come out here and you know give us a beautiful verse with so much grime in yeah. it and that's what i like tyler for and this was actually tyler's busiest year since 2013 in terms of features because i think he had four features but i want to like talk about the top three features that people you know know him for this year and that was of course something to rap about td off of uh, lil yachty's little boat three and um, west side guns 327 so joey i want you to rank those three features for me yeah let's go right on the spot man we're gonna put joey on the spot here that's so tough um i think i like something to rap about the most um i think he he just sounds great on this production um i think you could argue that his 327 verse is better but I'm just putting something to rap about number one because that's my, it's it's one of my favorite songs of the year too, and I think Tyler just sounds great on it. Um, 327 is next. I I just I want to point out too that I love how he's like not afraid to spit gay bars like over this Facts. Over what, very, very like traditional uh, like boom back production, which you know you could there's a whole line of um, there's a whole history of of hip hop being homophobic. So it's like kind of, kind of dope that he is not afraid to talk his shit about, uh, you know, glitter on his fingernails. Um, and TD's last, I, I, I love that song, but I think he got out rapped by Tira Wax. Um, that's definitely Tira. That's a, that's a hot take there. That's <laughs> a super hot take, man. Off on TD. So I, 
I gotta give that song to her. Yeah, they, they all went off. Even Rocky went super fucking hard. Even Yachty went crazy. Mm-hmm. That was and that whole that that whole like um, Tokyo Drift sample was absolutely <laughs> insane. And Tyler's feature run is impressive because he completely reinvented himself from 2019, and that's what I love about him. And it's completely diverse in anything we've gotten from him. And if he continues to go on runs like this, you know, we could sort of expect something sort of special from Tyler in the next couple of years as far as a project goes. Like, if he delivers another crazy project, he has a very celebrated discography in hip-hop. Yeah, and that's what I love about this feature run is that nobody expect him, expected him to go back to his gritty style after he released Igor, and he comes in 2020 and he drops these really dark verses where, you know, he's rapping, rapping. And TD is actually my favorite um, feature yeah, okay. from, from Tyler this year just because I love seeing him connect with Rocky as always. And he went off for like over a minute and a half on that song. Loved every second of it. Something to rap about number two and on number three, 327. So talk to me about this, Lou. What do you like about uh, so, so, what do you like about something to rap about? I almost forgot the song title. What do you fuck with it? But then why is it on number five, let's say? Yeah, I just, I love, you know, how Tyler even just starts the feature. He, he, he raps about how like this beat sounds like a boat I, I just bought. Like, he's just talking about how the beat sounds so expensive. And then, you know, just to hear how relaxed he is. And I just thought he killed it. Yeah, not only that, but Freddie Gibbs had a very crazy verse on this. And Alfredo is a fantastic project with full of value. Um, Joey, I want to ask you, before we go on to the next um, on to the next song at number four, why did you fuck with Alfredo so much? Because I've, I've seen you give it a lot of praise on your Twitter page. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the Alchemist production was great. Um... Freddie is always going to be top notch on lyricism. Like if you like Coke rap, you'll like Freddie Gibbs. Like he's just, he's, he's one of the best in that lane right now. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, it's also, it, all, it stands out to me too, as something, as the production, especially it's, it sounds more like sophisticated. It's, it's along those like Griselda lines. Um, and that's a little different to me than like anything else that came out this year, you know, is separated from Griselda. Yeah. yeah. So next up, we have a song from Drizzy Drake himself. And number four, introduce us. So listen, we got a song that is the perfect introduction to Certified Lover Boy, and that is Laugh Now, Cry Later. And I'll explain to you why this is the perfect song and the perfect introduction into Certified Lover Boy. Drake went into a lane that people want to hear him in. He went into this, um, you know, sort of this sort of intimate emotion about being so happy within yourself and understanding you and you know drake's drake's career has to be celebrated at this point and i don't think anyone is able to hate on drake just because he is able to continue breaking these accolades like at this point this guy um has the success of adele but he's doing it in hip-hop he's not even in pop at this point he's still rapping over crazy beats and he's doing it in a way where he's actually able to feature chicago drill artists like Lil dirk and that's what crazy is that you know he didn't have to dip into that bag or you know use that bag he was able to create a sort of sound that was nice for them both and the reason why i like this song so much is because it, it allows me to you know understand myself a bit better because it gives me the confidence to do that it allows me to go into the song um understand what drake's talking about take out those parallels and apply them to my life so i'm actually going to start with joey here bro why do you like the song so much and you know why do you what are your expectations let's say for certified lover boy yeah, I agree with everything you just said. Um, I think it showcases Drake's ability to make a hit that still is high quality. Um, not every artist can say that. Um, and I have semi-decent expectations for a certified lover boy. Um, I really want it to be good. I just am a little nervous, uh, given Scorpion was Drake's worst body of work, in my opinion. So I, I, I have high expectations after this song. I think... This song is a great start, um, and I'm hoping for for Take Care, Nothing Was the Same. If you're reading this, it's too late, Drake, on this next project. Yeah, and this song was, you know, a huge hit. It debuted at number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and it reached, I think, number one on the Canadian charts, um, and was also nominated at the Grammys for Best Rap Song as well as Best 
rap melodic performance, I believe. And um, a big thing with this song was also the music video, which went absolutely viral. It amassed over 180 million views as of right now on YouTube. And what was cool is that Drake actually shot this video at the Nike headquarters in Oregon. And, you know, of course, in the video, we have a Nike athletes such as Kevin Durant, Odell, Odell Beckham Jr. And it kind of feels kind of like a Nike commercial in a way. Yeah, it does. But Drake makes it work and he really, you know... It felt very cinematic, to say the least. It did feel cinematic, and it's the perfect um, concept, and it's the perfect thing that embodies digital marketing because he knew what he was going to be able to do with those influencers. He must have got a serious bag. Oh, he must have gotten a serious bag for that. But not only that, but you know, he has a beautiful supermodel, an IG model, rolling in a, a rolling in a Maybach that hasn't even released yet. You see him pulling up to the headquarters. Then after that, you see him, you know, playing ball with Kevin Durant, and then he gets tackled by Marshawn Lynch. He's throwing bombs to Odell Beckham Jr. There's so much going going on but he's able to you know grasp and 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 take the audience's attention to him and yes there's a bunch of influences influencers in there but the spotlight is always on him and that's what drake is so good at he's able to um get all of these collaborators to come together and you know to basically promote something for him but it never really takes away from his spotlight and not only that but i'm not sure if you guys saw this but off of the, the certified lover boy um drop before anything went in he was actually sending merchandise to a bunch of influencers so what's crazy is that as a marketer myself i'm able to realize this he's taking um, all of this influencing and all the social media influencing and really pushing his rollout that day r rather than, you know, pushing it on crazy billboards or doing commercials for it. Like he's really taking, you know, modern marketing to a whole different level with this. And this is why I love the song. But guys, we're reaching our top three right now. This is crazy. We got, we got through so much crazy material. And I want to, I want to ask you guys both this because we're going into our top three. You know, what did you, what were, what was the highlight of the year for you guys? And, you know, even though we didn't get some of the big dogs what did you guys like maybe from the low-key performances i'll start with you joey Whew, that's a that's a really tough question um my highlight is probably the griselda releases um partly because this is the first year i started listening to them but i think that i think underground just owned this year and i think griselda is like the front man for the underground right now um i so i love you know, I I specifically remember the Pray for Paris release night. Um, I remember the Burden of Proof. I remember the From a King to a God release. All of those release nights were, like, very memorable in my mind. Um, you got everyone talking about it on Twitter afterwards. Um, and not only afterwards, but in real time, which is dope. Um, so, yeah, Griselda's probably my number one. Also, just the – we got teases from J. Cole – Joey Badass and Isaiah Rashad, which we may or may not discuss in a little bit. Spoiler alert to our listeners. Um, mm. But yeah, those were all super dope teases from guys we hadn't heard in a while. So yeah, and and like you said, it was the year of the underground, and I think that a lot of you know hip hop listeners got put on to these crazy artists that they never knew about before this year. And I also think that it was the year of the comebacks, just because Logic, of course, came out with his retirement album, which blew everyone away. We had Jay Electronica come out of nowhere and drop his debut album after being in the game for 10 years plus. We got Big Sean drop a fantastic album after people thought that his career was kind of being shaky in a sense. And yeah, I was just really pleased with all the releases this year. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Lou on this one. It is the year of the comebacks and Logic's, I think Logic's No Pressure was the biggest highlight for me because I was a big Logic fan, um, especially when he was still in his young Sinatra bag and then after that he dropped under pressure the incredible true story and then after that like he kind of went into that pop lane that you know you were explaining to us where he's trying to make um, big hits but he couldn't necessarily find this sound so it was such a relief for me to see him be able to return to form and deliver us something that I knew he was always able to deliver because it was never a question if Logic was a top spitter or not it was always a question of is he releasing the best music that he can and is he doing his fan service because you know you saw that even after a point his fans weren't fucking with it anymore and he lost you know not that he lost the core of his fan base because logic was always had hunt you know tens of millions of listeners but it was sort of like where where do i stand now am i against logic or am i still with him you know because his, his whole discography is kind of getting diluted with bad projects so <laughs> that is my highlight of the year ladies and gentlemen but let's go on to number three and we have um we have why worry by isaiah rashad and I don't know how to feel about this song. I love it, but it sort of makes me sad because we haven't heard from Isaiah in four fucking years. Yeah, and we heard from him, you know, in April, uh, April twenty second, to be exact, of of this year, 
And it was like you said, it was the first time that we heard from him since the Suns tirade, which dropped, which dropped back in 2016. And, you know, the big question was what happened to Isaiah Rashad? Why is he taking all this time off? What's going on with him? And um, this song really just showed to me that he's been taking his time to craft something special. And everything from the production, which was done by Crooklyn, um, to Isaiah Rashad's vocal performance, and how relaxed and focused he sounds on this song. Like, he really sounds like he took his time to craft something special. Yeah, and he's also he's also allowing you to sort of um, understand his perspective on things, and that's what Isaiah does so well is that he's great with his imagery and he's great with his writing in a way where it's almost like watching a movie, and, and you know you're a you you could picture his lyrics in your head going. But I want to ask you guys this, you know, obviously we know Why Worry is a top level song of the year. Anything Isaiah releases, in my opinion, uh, well, I mean, if you look at uh, Sylvia Demo and you look at the Sun's Tirade, they're both nine on tens for me, probably even one being a bit higher. But I want to ask you, what happened to Isaiah Rashad? Like, I, I don't I don't know where he's been. Man. I mean, Joey, do you think that it's, it's a thing of maybe him feeling like he's under pressure? Or what do you think could be the factor as to why he's taking so much time? I think it's a TDE thing. I think that the leadership at TDE is being very careful with the music they're releasing because they want to set such a high standard for hip-hop. Um, I Shout out to my man punch um <laughs> I, I saw you had a back and forth with him right <laughs> so they so he even like he quote tweeted a, a roddy rich um article today and the the point of the article was that roddy was saying like i'm gonna take my time to release quality music i'm not gonna put something out like every three months just to put something out i want to take my time and punch was agreeing with him and so i think that this is just i think their whole label is just going by the standard that like we're only going to release our best shit and if it's not our best we're not going to release it so i think that they're really i think they're really being just meticulous with the art that they're creating so i can't on, on one hand i'm like pissed i'm like come on man where's kendrick where's isaiah but at the same time like you got to respect it and you gotta um you gotta have faith in them that they're putting out really good music or they're going to put out really good music because they have great track records. So I hope it. I, I hope so, man. I, I genuinely hope so. And I, I want to hear from another guy, and it's Absol, because we haven't heard from Absol since 2016 as well. And if we get the Absol, Isaiah, and Kendrick album, Joey, if what you're saying is true, that they're really trying to store their best music and they're trying to push it like that, then I'm completely fine with it. It's just, you know, obviously Kendrick was supposed to drop this year, but it wasn't for, if it wasn't for coronavirus. And then after that, Isaiah also came out and said that he also had a problems with uh, substance abuse a bit more or less and he was going through a lot of different problems so you know it's understandable why they've taken the time yeah, off he and, discusses that on the song yeah. where you know he's kind of yeah. struggling to stay sober but he feels happy when he's in a sober state of mind um and what's really cool too is that we've heard we've heard snippets from the house is burning which is supposed to be the title of isaiah's next album and what my question is is like Schoolboy Q is announced to be dropping in early 2021, and he just dropped back in 2019. So have Isaiah and Absol maybe not stepped up to the plate in terms of quality of their music? Or why are we getting a new Q album before a new Isaiah or Absol record? I don't know. I got to ask Joey this because he's the man that's friends with Punch. So you got to I'm going to put you on the I'm going to put you on the hot plate there, man. So what do you think it is? You think it's just a, a thing of them being extremely calculated or it's just maybe that, you know, Absol and Isaiah are not able to deliver on, on that level like they used to? I still, I still stand by the theory that it's this calculation. Um, but at the same time, like, so in 2019, Schoolboy probably had Crash Talk ready to go, and maybe the execs were like, "All right, let's let's hold off until we can put out like the top quality that we can." Um, but maybe he was like, "You know what? My shit's ready to go. I'm happy with it. Let's push it." So. Who, who knows? And maybe maybe this guy is just like outputting 10 times more songs than the rest of them. Who knows? Um, and I I think, uh, I know it got a lot of flack, but I think Crash Talk is a really good album. Fantastic so I, album. I think Schoolboy is going to put out quality no matter how often he drops. So we'll see though. It's, it's super, it's peculiar, honestly. Yeah. And someone else who's been very quiet until this year is Joey Badass. 
And I think that the light pack from Joey Badass is the biggest tease of 2020 just because he gave us three phenomenal songs and he just left us on the fucking hook wanting more. Yeah, and we got number two out of this, which is Shine. And this is a beautiful Roy Ayer sample. Um, there's so much going on in this track. But we, before we act, guys, we actually dive into this, I want to ask you, if if Joey gets into like this luxury vibe and gets into this mogul vibe that you know we sort of got a taste of, on on the light pack do you think that he's gonna automatically um enter that conversation of being a top 10 new york mc of all time uh, that's so tough just because yeah, i that, feel that's like the question i'm asking a, a lot of posi- like a lot of like the, the top 10 you could say your top 20 or top 30 new york mcs of the golden era of hip-hop of the 90s their, their places are kind of cemented and for someone who's just 25 years old to kind of be placed in those conversations it's tough to really put him there but i think that you know with 1999 he dropped one of the best projects of all time in the hip-hop um genre and i feel like he still has so much time to show us what he's capable of he hasn't even hit his fucking prime yet man how crazy is that how crazy is that this guy this guy could really come out of nowhere and drop like another five classics because he's 25 and we see now more than ever that you know the style of rap that joey's in if you look at push a t you look at you know let's say benny the butcher you look at conway they're all veterans you know like they're all guys that are past their 30s and that, you know, either have gone into their 40s. So now it's like, shit, what does he have to release in the next 15 years in order to get there? And if there's anyone on that race, I think it's Joey. Because if you look at the type of company he's sitting with, he's going to birthday dinners with Diddy and Jay-Z. Like, this is no joke anymore. So, Joey, when you first heard the light pack, what were your initial thoughts on it? And, you know, do you think that Joey's actually going to drop in 2021? I I definitely could see him dropping in 2021. Um, I think the light pack, you guys said it best. I think it was a it was a huge tease because it was great, but it's at the same time it's like, all right, when are we actually gonna get a Joey album? Who knows? Um, but yeah, I think it's 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 hella exciting because he's so young yet has so much talent. Like he's he could he, literally like on a on a lyrical level, he can he can out rap anyone, literally anyone. Like I. I would honestly, I would put him against even Nas. Like he's that good. But the, I think his his challenge for the next few years is composition of his next album. Like he needs to make sure that the hooks are prime. He needs to make sure the production's outstanding. We already know he can wrap his ass off. He just needs to like put together a complete project that will cement him as one of the greats. Yeah, I need to hear more of that Static Selecta because, you know, every time I get Joey on a Static Selecta production, I know what's going down. And, you know, if, if there's one person that I want to see take over this whole project, it's Static. And if there's someone that I want to see ex, ex, like, um, exec this project, it's Diddy. Because both of those guys have such deep roots and foundation into New York hip hop. And that's the sort of recipe for, you know, perfection. And that's what you need. And that's what Joey needs is that guidance because he's only 25 at the, at, right now, right? And yeah. he needs these veterans to show them like, okay, like this is what you got to do to be able to, you know, advance your career and, you know, kind of diversify from what you've been able to get. Because um, a complaint that I hear with Joey is that, you know, uh, he kind of raps about the same content matter. And that's absolute bullshit. I'm sorry. You know, if you're going to talk about that, just don't listen to Joey's music. But it is a conversation. You know, there is, there's people talking about it and you know it's something that's definitely that's definitely there but if he's able to diversify his content and go into this mogul slash um sort of rich mindset and sort of give his knowledge on wealth because joey's a fantastic businessman dude i'm all for it bro that's gonna be fucking incredible yeah and he's sounding like a mogul at 25 like you said which is absolutely crazy and i just i love the luxury feeling of the song shine and of course static selecta blew it out of the park um he used a sample from roy ayers i think it's called everybody loves the sunshine yes sir it's a 70s soul sample it fits in perfectly and i think that it's it might be the best use of a sample on a hip-hop beat in 2020 and um just i I love how insightful joey is on this song you know he has a bar where he says i i then made 10 million spit in verses and i still haven't lost my purpose and that speaks to the fact that He's been so successful in his hip hop career in a changing time where, you know, rapping about the the, the content he raps about isn't popular anymore, but he still manages to find that audience for it. And I think that that's a big narrative for Joey Badass's career is that he was maybe born in the wrong era, but he's he's keeping that that 90s hip hop alive. 
Yeah, and he's going to continue paying homage to that because that's what he was inspired by. And he made 1999 when he was 17, right? Like, that was it? He made it when he was 17? That's, yeah. that's the exact age? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so think about that. He made one of the best hip hop uh, hip hop um, projects of all time at 17 years old. And I, I feel completely comfortable calling it that just because there's so much quality and there's so much depth that that that, that, that album dives into. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And it gives me shivers just talking about 1999 because every time I go back to the project, it just gives me this nostalgic feeling. And, you know, he you're able to put it past the drought three you're able to put it past um j cole's friday night lights you're able to put it past let's say mac miller's kids like it's it's just it's that number one place for me but listen speaking about the number one place we're going to a guy that is another man who was expected to drop and you know everyone's talking about the fall off 2020 but we have not got it this year so at number one place we have the climb back which is our song of the year so joey i'm gonna let you take the floor on this one what do you like about this song and do you think that Cole is actually going to drop the fall off in 2021? All right, so this might piss people off, but I don't think there's any way he's dropping in this next month. Um, I just think, I don't think he'll do a surprise drop. I think there will be a legit rollout for it. And at this point, I think it's too late, um, unfortunately. But I have, to, I have to agree with you. The climb back is definitely my song of the year as well. It's just, it's vintage Cole. You got great production you've got great bars, you've got a great hook. Like it's just every little piece of this puzzle comes together and it's, he, he does everything well in this song. And I, I loved it because I saw people on Twitter the day after it dropped, like people that hate this man, like literally like shit on everything he does, but they were even praising the song saying like, Hey, this actually sounds pretty good. So it's like, I, I haven't met someone who dislikes this song. It's it's it goes crazy. So I I thought it just was the perfect summation of 2020. Like nothing normal happened this year. Like there was a lot of disappointment, but there were like silver linings in the disappointment. Um, and it just you know was the epitome of how my year went. So I yeah I, I love this song. Yeah, so do I, man. And I think that it's just, it's absolutely shocking that the climb back received no Grammy nominations whatsoever. Huge snub there. And I just, I love J. Cole's hunger on this song. Like this yeah. just brought me back to, you know, 2014 Forest Hills Drive where he's hungry to, to, to prove his worth as a lyrical MC again. And he actually wrote an essay in the Players' Tribune this year where he said how he hasn't felt the hunger he feels right now um, you know, since maybe 2016. And he said that that hunger wasn't there with, with KOD. Um, so it's just, it's, it's great to see him back in his lyrical bag. It's great to see him try to prove something once again. And I think that this song is further evidence that you can't touch J. Cole's rapping abilities just because he is a top 10 rapper right now, maybe even top five. No, most definitely. And um, he's he's incredible like the way he's able to use his flow able to use his delivery and still deliver these witty clever bars while you know keeping this beautiful insight without over complicating is absolutely mind-blowing because i don't know any mc that's able to do that and you know people knock 2018 KOD, we, we had a similar conversation with, with Colin from Team Dreville on our first episode, and we all agreed that 20, like, you know, KOD was actually a fantastic project. Like, there was, it, it's, it's maybe not his strongest. And I, I, I want to ask Joey about yeah, that yeah, after. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask Joey about, the, about KOD after this, but conceptually, there was, there was not an album, um, maybe in that league that year and i don't know like i would have to go pack i, no, I would say swimming taboo. swimming taboo to swimming, yeah. swimming to uh, maybe care for me as well but it was definitely up there it was definitely it, up it there. was up there maybe not as quality as a project but conceptually and the sort of cinematic value that you got from it it was there so joey i'm gonna ask you about kod dude how do you feel about it because there is so many mixed receptions about it yeah i so i really enjoy it um i think the mixed reception comes from Cole trying something different. Um, I think this album was outside of his comfort zone. Um, he experimented with some trap sounds. He His approach on this album was to take the sounds that a lot of up and coming rappers were using, like basically take the, the popular generic sound and put his own spin on it while like preaching, not preaching, but like giving a narrative to this younger generation, giving advice to the younger generation about 
you know, the dangers of drugs and other addictions like social media and power. So I, I think it's a really good project. I think people are going to dislike it because it's different and it's not vintage coal, but I think it's a good thing. I, I welcome the change. Um, like KO, the title track KOD sounds very different than what Cole has done in the past, but it has some of his best rapping ever. Um, it's Fact. got a good message. The, the whole, the whole uh, project has a really good message. And I think people just get lost in the notion that like, Oh, he's preaching. Um, I don't like that. He's like telling me what to do, but that's not it. Like a lot of people need to hear this shit. Like I see people on Twitter every day saying like this album saved my life. Like I was addicted to this. I like, was getting into this drug and I, you know, listened to this album, I decided not to. Like it, it might be corny to one person, but it might be a life saver saver to another. So I it has, you know, a few of my favorite cool songs on it and I think it's a dope project, but just like a little different than what he's done. In the yeah, it was definitely a really important album to a lot of people. Um I wanna end off by asking you guys this. Do you think the fall off will be Cole's final album? Oh, okay, I'm gonna start this off. I think so. But I don't think he's going to stop making music completely. Um, I just think at this point in his career, even if he was to leave us with one more classic, like one more album, you know, that compares to 2014 or that compares to For Your Eyes Only, there's nothing left for him to do. Like, you know, he could continue making music. He could go down that lane. But I just, I don't picture Cole that way because he's such a calculated dude. And I don't see him taking, let's say, the Eminem route and releasing albums that are past and overdue, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want him to deliver like that. What I want, like, what I would want him to do, and this is selfish of me, is to release the fall off and just completely concentrate on Dreamville because there is so much talent and so much raw talent on Dreamville that could be transformed into something absolutely incredible. And, and you know, that's what I want. I want him to to give that experience give that knowledge to his people that he's probably already doing you know who the fuck am i kidding but it's so it's going to be so nice for him to see you know see him retire as a grandfather and just you know watch his grandchildren be able to you know flourish and do their own thing in the music industry and why is because i've been following this guy for 10 years now you know i saw how hungry he was on his mixtapes you know i saw the highs of his career i saw the lows of his career and now it's kind of like this would be the perfect way to ride off in the sunset for him so you know that's my take on it how about you joey do you you know do you want this to be his last album let's say or do you think it is going to be it so I, I think that's a really good take that he'll finish this and just focus on Dreamville. I think that's a really smart move. But what I could see him doing is coming back after a big break. So maybe he takes five, ten years off, and I could see him coming back and making more music. Um, because I think we're we're in an age where like all these uh, older, mature rappers are releasing projects from like a different stage of their life, but it's it's like really quality. Like we've seen that with black thought. We've seen that with Nas. We've seen that with, um, Jay Z 444. So like these rappers are continuously showing us that they can still rap at a high level into their fifties. So I, I don't see why J Cole and Kendrick can't, um, you know, continue that trend, but we'll see, like you said, like Eminem has put out some lackluster projects since getting older. So that's always a big worry, but I, I have faith that like J. Cole would be smart about it and like would retire if he felt like he didn't have anything to give us um, or would keep going if he if he felt like he did. Yeah, I'm just really excited to see what Cole, what, what Cole brings for us on the fall off. And I think that there is a slight hope that it comes this year, but it'll probably come 2021 to be yeah, honest. If, he, if he's smart, he really rolls us all right and he cashes out on everything because people are hungry to hear him and the climb back was the perfect narrative for that because every single Cole fan tuned in for that and you guys could see that the demand for J. Cole is as high as ever and if he's going to release another project it is going to be quality. So ladies and gentlemen that is our list and number one we have J. Cole's The Climb Back and it is definitely a clear winner for us, dude. It's a general consensus around the hip hop community that this is a quality track. So that's why we included it. Thank you guys so much for watching throughout it. But I'm going to give the floor to Joey now to talk a bit a, a bit more about himself and his awesome platform. So go ahead, dude, and explain to us what you do a bit more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just a normal guy who works the nine to five and during my lunch break and off hours, I'm on Twitter, like tweeting about the shit that I love, which is hip hop. Um, been listening to hip hop since I was in middle school and have just like really found a voice with it through Twitter, which has been awesome just to talk about, you know, the shit that I love to listen to. So 
Um, I, yeah, I'm always posting daily content. I'm always in the DMs talking with random people that I have never met before, like about music, which is amazing. Um, I found a great community and um, have found great people like NFR, like you guys, um, to, you know, just speak about our passion of music with. So, uh, yeah, give me a follow at Joey underscore hip hop. Um, would love to chat music with you sometime. Absolutely. Joey is a great guy and we have to thank him for coming onto the show. He gave us a great amount of, um, information, especially about that whole TDE thing. He's homies with punch. So it's an absolute honor having it. Look, he's laughing on the screen right now, but <laughs> it's been a great episode, man. You know, we love doing these top 10 lists, especially towards the end of the year, because it allows us to understand everything that's happened over the course of the year and obviously get ready for a new one because 2021 has some heavy drops coming in. We have Kendrick rumored. We have J. Cole rumored, who we just talked we about. We have Drake confirmed. Oh my goodness, dude. There's, we have Kid Cudi that's probably going to drop in 2021 as well because I don't see him releasing in December. Listen, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with both of you. Um, you know, this is NFR. We're connecting the world to hip hop. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification tab. And you guys enjoy the rest of your day.